Hello, Wayne County Community College students. Uh, we're here today to finish up our lecture from the gram positives and gram negatives. We left off last time with gram negatives, um, probably with Pseudomonas uh, rigenosa. I know I have it written up here again, but that's just because I just remembered that we went over it already, but it's up here again. But here today, we got some miscellaneous bacteria, some other bacteria that I want to introduce. Uh, look at the back of your text of, I think it's the uh, chapter, let's see, I think we did, but probably 21, and you'll see these bacteria. And that's a good thing to also just read the back of your text. They have little quizzes in there and other information that kind of gives a great outline of the text. So that's something to keep um, in the back of each chapter is what I mean. So let's get to it. This is Legionella uh, pneumophilia. I guess it just really likes causing pneumonia and it does, Legionella does. Um, it requires a special lab uh, growth media to, in order to grow this bacteria. It often lives in close association with amoebas. So that tells us that it is a water-loving source. It loves to be with um, water. It causes cough, fever, and diarrhea, and a severe pneumonia. There's a story behind this, getting uh, this name, Legionella. Uh, there was a Legionnaire's Convention, I think it was in Philadelphia, uh, in the 80s, I believe. And all these men at this convention uh, ended up getting sick because they turned on the air conditioning in this convention hall and everybody just breathed in this bacteria. And they were rushed to the hospital. And uh, these were like middle-aged men and they developed pneumonia. So hence the name Legionella, right? From Legionnaires uh, 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 Convention. So it involves the transmission by aerosolized water. So remember, it really is a water-loving bacteria. Seen in like whirlpools, spas, um, and air conditioners, as we mentioned before. The interesting thing about this, it is not transmitted person to person. And that's the kind of stuff that we look for in an exam. If you have a pneumonia, but this one has to come from the water source itself. It is not transmitted uh, person to person. So remember that. Um, the next one, Helicobacter pylori. This is an interesting one too, this bacteria. Helicobacter pylori. Many people have suffered from ulcers, gastritis, and you get your medication and you just keep getting these, uh, um, you know, medication that you think that will help with the uh, ulcers, um, I don't know, like protein pump inhibitors or um, some people would take like Pepto-Bismol, try to not eat acid foods, etc. Never, never did we think a bacteria was the thing that was causing the ulcers. So once that was figured out, that was huge. And this helicobacter pylori has now been able to be treated with antibiotics. You need like, uh, it's a triple treatment, three things have to be used to treat Hel Helicobacter pylori, but it does um, help get rid of ulcers. These really do mainly affect like the uh, pylorus region and the duodenum or duodenum of the um, gut. So that's pretty interesting. And another interesting thing about it is it creates an alkaline environment where you know that the stomach um, it's very acidic, but this bacteria creates an alkaline environment, and then it is able to do its thing, okay? Um, this one, uh, Francisella tularemia, tularemia. Um, this is transmitted actually by arthropods, like flies, uh, I mean, not flies, ticks, ticks and it's carried by rabbits and mice um, and, and squirrels. So these animals are the reservoirs for this uh, 
we really just call it by this last name, uh, tularemia. And sometimes like when you get your can, for example, canned goods, and you know they've been in a warehouse, etc. You really should rinse off your the top lids of your cans before you go and try to open them up because sometimes animals will urinate on them. You know, it's a warehouse, so animals do get in there. And um, you don't want to get this particular um, uh, kind of um, bacteria. Animals are reservoirs for this. It's transmitted by ticks. Animals can have, I mean, humans can have fever, swollen lymph nodes, ulcerative uh, lesions, conjunctivitis, and uh, can contract pneumonia as well. This is a pretty good one. Interesting, Yersinia pestis. Very interesting. It caused the bubonic plague during the Middle Ages. Middle Ages, um, like 400 AD to 1000 AD. This is the 5th through the 15th century during this time frame. This bubonic plague, or they call it the Black Plague, whatever, it wiped out nearly 60% of Europe. This is, uh, this is carried by uh, fleas on rodents. And you get the flea bite, and then your skin, where they call it... Uh, like it becomes a bullet and becomes this big uh, kind of swollen looking bump on your skin and the skin starts to get necrotic and uh, you get fever, headaches, nausea, etc. These fleas are on these little rodents but in our country, I know it happened in Europe and it happened during the Middle Ages, but uh, in our country, we can see this carried in uh, prairie dogs. So it's still, it, we're still able to get uh, uh, Yersinia pestis. It didn't go anywhere. It's just that it's carried now, at least in our country, uh, prairie dogs. So animals can have a lot of bacteria but that may not be, of course, uh, infectious to them, but it can, um, the flea, the tick, any arthropod that it is, it can jump off of that particular animal, bite the human, and the human will get sick. That's the point I'm making with these. Same one with this one, Borrelia uh, burgdorferi. This causes Lyme disease. And I wanted to bring this one up because as often as it occurs, a lot of people don't get diagnosed properly. Actually, they're misdiagnosed until somebody goes, oh, maybe you have Lyme disease. And I mean, it's like an afterthought where this should be kind of really uh, thought about. If a person comes in with fever, maybe sometimes it goes away, it comes back, um, a, a whole host of issues like, achiness, uh, arthritis, uh, especially in um, like younger people. I know younger people could still, you could get juvenile, uh, rheumat you could get juvenile arthritis, but I'm just saying this one comes with such a whole headaches, just a whole host of problems. Um, then you need to really think about, hey, maybe it could be Lyme disease. So that is a really, good thing to check. Another thing too, if you see a certain kind of rash, this usually, but it may be in the head, see, in the hair, or in the head, on the scalp, you'd have to shave the head to see it. It looks like a bullseye or a target. That is the rash of Lyme disease caused by this bacteria, Borrelia burgdorferi. So if you see this very distinct rash that's circular with another circle around it, looking like a bullseye, then this is the disease to treat. And you can treat it with antibiotics, so it's not uh, a big deal. The main thing is if you're going camping or going into any wooded area, try to stay on the trail and don't go off the trails. Usually that's when you get this, this little tick. And um, the ticks, 
live on deer and mice. And then this tick bite, it jumps off the deer or the mouse, whatever, and gets on you, uh, then that's how you end up getting the disease. Uh, the name of the tick, I don't know why they named this tick, uh, these ticks, exoides. So they know a lot about it, but for some reason it gets misdiagnosed quite often. So that's something that you just start having a lot of symptoms and you don't know where it's going, just have them check you for uh, this. It's antibiotic and then you don't have to worry about it because if it's left untreated, you, it may cause cardiac, neurological, and arthritic symptoms. So that's the reason. Uh, let's look at chlamydia. Chlamydia um, is an obligate intracellular parasite. In other words, it needs a host. It needs somewhere to uh, reside in order to uh, cause its uh, infection. And so it needs a host. I want you to remember that what is best friends with chlamydia? What other disease did we learn? It's a gram negative and it's diplococci. Uh, what other one? Correct, gonorrhea. Gonorrhea and chlamydia are best friends. So if you get treated for one, you must get treated for the other, and that's two different antibiotics, and make sure your doctor um, prescribes that and gives that to you so that you can be totally healed of this STD. Now, this is chlamydia trichomonas or trichomatis, and it causes eye disease. It can eventually cause blindness, as well as it being a sexually transmitted disease, which, of course, can then lead to uh, infertility, especially in women, because women may not ever know that they had chlamydia. It doesn't have the kind of same symptoms like something oozing out of the orifice or something, uh, no foul smell or anything like that. Chlamydia is very, um, I don't know, insidious. So it's very sneaky, so you may not know. But usually you will because it goes along with gonorrhea. All right, so this is an STD that can lead to uh, infertility. And also, especially if the woman has it, the uh, baby comes through the birth canal, it gets coated with the bacteria, it can lead to blindness. And of course, that's preventable by giving the baby um, uh, ocular prophylaxis. In other words, putting medicine in the eyes just like we do for gonorrhea. Um... I was going to say something else about that because if I am correct, I just thought of this, I'd have to check, but um, there's another type of this chlamydia that will cause blindness, but it's from like the flies and stuff to get around the eyes. Have you seen that? Like in, on, in, they always show these pictures of Africans and these flies all around. That too can cause uh, a blindness and I believe it's I believe it's from this but I, I would have to check that so don't take that just go with the other stuff that I said all right uh, where is this so Pseudomonas originosa this is also a water source it needs a water source just like uh, Legionella it likes a water source has this bluish green color. If you've ever really uh, seen it, you've seen it in the lab, in the test tube, and after a while it will turn into bluish green, but it will also do that to wounds. Or um, I've seen people who came into the hospital and get their leg uh, amputated, and later it will have, <laughs> this, is, this is from a bacterial infection, so it's, you shouldn't have it, but I have seen it on the wound as it was healing. A beautiful greenish blue color, I mean, you know, you think it's really pretty, but it's an infection. Not supposed to have it. Um, it's found in the soil and in water. Um, burn uh, victims often develop uh, are very susceptible to Pseudomonas aeruginosa, as well as uh, cystic fibrosis uh, patients. Definitely, if they have an pneumonia, it will be caused by um, Pseudomonas aeruginosa due to the uh, biofilm formation. So that is one thing. You could get also a hot tub folliculitis with that. Remember like in the 
80s, I think it was. Um, a lot of people were going to hot tubs. I can't imagine just going to a community hot tub now, sitting in the same water that somebody else had just sat in. You're sitting on this kind of wooden bench that somebody else just finished sitting on. And Oh my God. So it caused a hot tub folliculitis. You got all these little bumps and irritations all over the bottom of your body. But So that is Pseudomonas originosa. Let's look at Mycoplasma pneumoniae. Mycoplasma pneumoniae. This is called atypical pneumonia. Atypical pneumonia. It's an unusual pneumonia because, or it's just not typical, because you still feel like you could function pretty well, except sometimes you'll you have a fever and you could, you could take Tylenol or, or Motrin and the fever will go down and you'll feel okay and then you'll have fever again. And you won't even necessarily have like a lot of coughing, but you may. So it's, it's atypical, usually seen in uh, younger people, young adults, teenagers, that around that, but anybody could get it, but usually seen it. The interesting thing about mycoplasma pneumoniae is that this bacteria lacks a cell wall. It doesn't have a cell wall, so that's an interesting feature about it. So those interesting features are things that usually show up on exams. So uh, mycoplasma uh, pneumoniae, not having a cell wall is a unique feature that may show up on exam. It spreads slowly over the internal respiratory surfaces, causing fever, uh, pain, chest pain, and sore throat. And so a variety of things that it causes, but it does not have, uh, it lacks a cell wall. Uh, let's see, what is this? Enterobacteriaceae, a huge category. Um, the family of Enterobacteriaceae includes the gram negatives that we had on the last slide, Serratia, E. coli, Salmonella, Proteus, um, Klebsiella, those types of bacteria. Uh, the interesting thing about uh, Enterobacteriaceae, this is it's a gram negative um, uh, enterics. So the ones I just mentioned, E. coli, serratia, all those. These are gram-negative enterics that have a complex surface antigens that are important in pathogenicity are also the basis of immune responses. So the, the complex surface antigens are what cause the family of enterobacteriaceae to become pathogenic. Right, and and um, the other thing I wanted you to know, which I almost forgot, is that this entire group, which this is on the test, ferments glucose. So I wanted you to remember that Enterobacteriaceae it ferments glucose. And if we had done that enteral tube, school hadn't ended, we would have inoculated the enteral tube. That would be something that you would with some gram negatives, you would have seen that it does indeed ferment um, uh, glucose. You can look in the back of your lab book and you will see something called an enteral tube and you can see the different, it's a lot of little different auger in there that will change colors based on what bacteria it is and then you can use that to determine which bacteria you inoculate in. Sometimes we use it for the unknown when we get to the unknown, but you can use an intro to inoculate it. It's just a tube that has a lot of different augers in it and you would get use a sterile needle and you push it in through all those augers and then you pull it back out and cap it. So if we had been in this class, we would have used this intro tube to, to determine that. Uh, the other thing about Enterobacteriaceae, uh, I don't have any space on here. Let me see. Well, remember the H antigen, the K antigen, and the O antigen? So I want to, I'm going to erase this part. And remember the H antigen had to do with the flagella. The K antigen 
had to do with the capsule. That's probably easy to remember because K goes with capsule. And then the O antigen, I talked about these on the previous slide. This has to do with, um, actually this has to do with the polysaccharide. And that's going to be important for uh, several reasons. So let me go over it. The H antigen has a flagella or flagella, 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 whatever. That means that it's a motile species, like E. coli, for example, motility. The K antigen for the capsule, this is related to virulence. And remember, that's because it that capsule will prevent um, phagocytosis. The O antigen is a polysaccharide. That really has to do with that lipopolysaccharide. Remember the LPS in gram negatives? The L, yeah, in gram negatives, the LPS. That really is implicated in the endotoxic uh, shock. Now, Point I'm making about these Enterobacteriaceae, which is a huge family, and I, you know, I mentioned it before: Serratia, E. coli, Salmonella, Proteus, Klebsiella. Those are examples of Enterobacteriaceae. Some will have an H antigen, meaning they have a flagella. Some will have a K antigen, meaning they have a capsule. But all Enterobacteriaceae will have an O antigen, which makes them virulent. Okay, LPS or this polysaccharide uh, of an endotoxin will make the bacteria virulent. So not all the species carry the H and the K, but all species have LPS, and that causes endotoxic shock. Let's look at Vibrio cholera. Vibrio cholera. You can see the word cholera here, so you can pretty much guess what that causes. It causes cholera. It's a nice little comma-shaped bacteria, kind of shaped like a comma. Uh, who makes it comma like that, right? But it might be that way, so I'll just make it this way, like that. Um, it it, it uh, produces a profuse, and I mean profuse, a lot of diarrhea, but it's a rice water diarrhea, meaning it comes out like it's flowing out of a faucet, the, the poop does, the diarrhea does. But it has these little specks in it that remind people of rice. So it's little white specks in the diarrhea that are just coming out and it looks like rice water. So that's why they call it rice water stool or rice water diarrhea. It's endemic in developing countries, whatever that is. You know, some people call it third world, which I don't like. But developing country will be a country that is getting up off of its own, uh, into its own economy, of course. Um, they don't have a lot of infrastructure. But let me just put it this way. We have seen... Cases of cholera in our country, especially during hurricanes, and that one I can recall is Hurricane Katrina. We saw cholera there because people were trying to get water, but nobody, you know, the helicopters were going over, the president was going around looking at them, all the news cameras were filming people, but nobody threw them a bottle of water. So they were just the thirst center, the thirst center in the hypothalamus is very, very strong. So they would start drinking the water, and it's dirty. Bodies are floating around, animals, but they drank that water and then ended up with having copper. So it comes from, you know, dirty water, dirty food, things like that, ingested food or water that's uh, contaminated with this bacteria. Um, prompt oral rehydration is the key. Uh, if you can't stand it orally because you may keep throwing up or something, but really you have diarrhea with this one, then you can get an IV, and in this country, that's really no problem. Um, the interesting thing about cholera is it ha it you need a high infectious dose in order to get really sick from it. So a 10 to the 8th cells, a 10 to the 8th, that's a high dose. 
in order to really uh, get sick from uh, cholera. All right, let's go to this one, syphilis. Syphilis is a old school STD. I mean, like really old school since biblical times and before. Um, syphilis is um, gram negative. But it's a little spirochete. It's a spirochete. Very similar to which other one? Lyme disease or Borrelia burgdorferi, also a spirochete. And the spirochetes kind of look kind of wiggly like that. So that's the way that bacteria looks. It's a spirochete. Um, it is caused by um, a treponema. Oh, where can I write that? Uh, palladium. So this is for syphilis. I should have had this down. This is the treponema. Kind of a cute name. Palladium. All right. That goes here, for syphilis, right? It's a venereal disease, and it could cause congenital syphilis, of course. Congenital syphilis, let me just mention this because this is the part that's on the exam. You can get Hutchinson's teeth, and you'll see a nice picture in your textbook. Um, if, congenital means um, the a fetus was infected with the disease while in utero, so they are born with it. So you could be born with syphilis and it affects the way the teeth are. The little ridges or like the teeth look kind of like that in the front. So kind of edgy like this in the front. It's grooves in the teeth in the, it's grooves in the teeth. So let's just leave it at that. Um, what else about syphilis? Oh, it's virulence, which I usually ask about virulence, is involved in an inflammatory, the spirochete is involved in an inflammatory response. So most times you don't want your body, um, well most times when the body, let me put it this way, just scratch that. When the body is inflamed, it means it's fighting something. This spirochete causes an inflammation in the body. Interesting thing about it is you can have primary, secondary, or tertiary syphilis. Primary syphilis, you have a painless chancre, meaning the chancre is just a little sore that's kind of just grooved out. Usually, for men, it's like on the wherever the entryway of this uh, of uh, the treponema palladium enter, wherever this bacteria enter the spirochete. Uh, usually, it's on the tip of the penis for the male. And it'll just be a little groove, like a little crater that's kind of red. And, um, but it's not, it doesn't hurt. So it's a painless chancre. That's primary syphilis. And you see that, you go get penicillin, boom, you cure it of it. Um, better yet, just wear a condom, then you don't have to worry about that or anything else. The other thing is secondary syphilis is more like uh, rash, um, uh, fever, uh, headache, lymphadenopathy, where you got swelling in the in your lymph nodes, you got rash on the um, palms of the hands, the soles of the feet. That's one disease that when I see that, and this is one other disease that gets a rash on the palms of the soles, the hands of the feet, but. Generally, um, that's why I usually don't like to shake hands. That wasn't mainly because of syphilis, but now it's a lot of reasons on why. Uh, because of I'm not shaking hands anymore. Um, third or tertiary degree syphilis, of course, causes organ failure due to um, the blood vessel damage, especially in the brain. Um, and you could get neurological problems. It, blood vessels in the eye could cause um, blindness, and you get these tumors called gummas in the body. The interesting thing about having tertiary, or they call it neurosyphilis, is oftentimes people in nursing homes or 
or, or um, those kind of homes where you're taking care of elderly, they will say the person has dementia. And of course, Alzheimer's is a form of dementia. But it could just be syphilis. It could be syphilis, which you could cure with um, antibiotics. So, if, so don't, let's not always just jump to dementia, okay? Let's try to see if there's another disease. And you do that by taking a blood test. Um, I think you check a, a VDRL and um, and um, our, uh, well, I remember VDRL, can't remember the other one, but it's two tests and then you may, may just be able to get that person out of the nursing home, they take care of themselves and have a great rest of their life, right? Um, so that's syphilis. Oh, interesting thing about syphilis too, there was something called a Tuskegee experiment done on black men in the 30s all the way to the 70s. The government performed experiments on these men with syphilis when there was an antibiotic, penicillin, that could have cured them. And they never told these men. So the men, of course, they had girlfriends, wives, etc. They affected them. The wives had children, which affected them, and the babies came out, you know, with congenital syphilis, with a whole slew of problems. Um, this went on for like 40-something years. Nobody said a word. And it was just brought up when, um, you know, somebody discovered it and blew the whistle, so to speak. This could have been going on. So when we talk about health disparity and why certain groups of people don't want to go to the doctor, or perhaps they don't trust the medical field, let's always go back to the root of that and find out why is that. That's not just something that's made up. It's a way certain groups of people are treated in the medical profession, particularly, but in the whole, any institution, but particularly the medical profession. And um, there's a lot of, um, shall I say, um, untrustworthiness about it. So we have to keep this in mind on why certain health problems are um, exacerbated in certain communities. And I would say particularly the black community. Um, so that was called the Tuskegee Experiment. Um, you know, they were just looking at the effects of syphilis on people, but they used uh, black men from the South to do the experiment on, unfortunately, and they never told them. Um, let's see, what's the next one? Listeria, oh, Listeria monocytogenes. Listeria is a gram positive. Um, it's really a contaminant of dairy products. Uh, some deli meats, poultry, and it causes a foodborne uh, listeriosis. Bacterial cells multiply in the host's cytoplasm. This is why they tell pregnant women not to eat uh, soft cheeses like feta, and I'm not sure, maybe cottage cheese, I don't know, that's a soft cheese. And because it could still have this um, kind of bacteria, but I think cottage cheese is pasteurized, so I doubt if they would have it. But like, let's say just leave it at feta and whatever other soft cheese you may know about. Um, the last couple of things I want to go over are septic shock and uh, gangrene. Let's talk a little bit about septic shock. Um, over 100,000 patients die annually from septic shock due to the presence of the LPS, the lipopolysaccharide that we have in gram negatives. And of course, it's in the outer membrane of bacteria, but let's say it's gram negatives for sure, or that is what has it. So the, the symptoms of septic shock are tachycardia, uh, um, fast heart rate, which is over 100 beats per minute while resting, uh, reduced blood flow to the organs, right? Respiratory failure and a weak pulse. So the only thing you're going to have that's up or increased on here is going to be an increase in heart rate. Increase in heart rate. 
decrease in pulse, decrease in blood flow, uh, decrease in blood pressure, and a decrease in breathing. And that's, of course, called respiratory failure. So that's what septic shock looks like. And we get that generally from uh, bacteria being uh, in the blood, being in the blood. Let's look at uh, recommended gangrene treatment, how you would treat someone that has gangrene. We see that a lot in our country, basically not so much due to somebody getting injured, but we see it set up in patients that have diabetes, that they've gotten injured somewhere, um, stepped on a nail, may not have known that they stepped on it because they have uh, neuropathy in their feet, no feeling in the feet. Um, Maybe they had a heating pad on the legs, and this happened to my uncle, had a heating pad on the legs, and he didn't feel that the heating pad was, um, I guess he turned it on high, I don't know, but he ended up burning his legs through the night when he slept, and uh, over days it became gangrenous, and it had to be amputated. So the first thing, of course, and this is not in any order, but because the first thing I would do is you, if you think you have gangrene or before you get it, is to have rigorous, rigorous cleaning of the deep wounds. But let's start here at the beginning. Debridement of the wounds, so try to take anything, all the dead skin off, and just leave the healthy pinkish skin there so that it can heal better. Um, hyperbaric chambers, this high oxygen in a room, they put you in a room or in a actually a container sometimes and you just get a lot of oxygen and usually that'll kill the bacteria or have it grow slower, uh, grow at a slower rate because usually that bacteria may be anaerobic in your treatment with oxygen, which it doesn't like. Uh, amputation of the affected limb, it seems like as modern as medicine has gotten, this is still the only way to 100% effectively treat uh, a gangrenous uh, limb is to just cut it off, amputate it, and that's old school way of taking care of things, but it still works. It definitely will stop the uh, growing and infiltration of, uh, exacerbation of the gangrene. And they're rigorous, of course, the rigorous cleaning of the deep wounds. So I think for those chapters that we have, um, that I've assigned, these were just some other bacteria that I wanted to go over. They didn't quite fit in some categories. So, um, and they were interesting bacteria. All of them are interesting. But like I said, I can't teach all the bacteria. So there's tons and tons and millions and millions of bacteria. So these are ones that I think you will see more often in clinics, um, along with the gram positive, gram negative sheet that uh, we went over in uh, lectures one and two. This will be lecture three, and that will conclude our lectures on the gram-positive, gram-negatives, and other bacteria. Uh, the next thing we're going to do, we're going to pick it up with viruses. Wow. Yep, go figure. I know people have a lot of interest in that now. So we're going to pick it up with viruses, and until then, keep studying those chapters I mentioned to you, gram-positive, gram-negatives, and others. I'll talk to you later.